Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God the Father of us and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't know if you think this way, but as a kid, I certainly thought this way. Pastor's always preaching on the gospel. Why doesn't he ever preach on the Old Testament? Why do we bother even reading the Old Testament lessons if they're not going to address it? And I suppose we could even say the same thing for the epistles as well. Certainly, they get mentioned from time to time, but only in relationship to the gospel appointed for the day. Part of this is because we preach Christ and him crucified, and so our focus is on Jesus Christ, and the gospel is clearly about Jesus. So that takes priority. I know it does in my own preaching, but this week the words of the Old Testament really spoke to me. I especially like the description of running from a lion only to run into a bear and then manage to escape from the bear and arrive safe at home only to be bitten by a snake and die. Well, there's tragic humor in that description. It reminds me of Daffy Duck or Wile E. Coyote, and it relates to how I've been feeling personally during this pandemic in an election year. So I'm taking up the challenge. I'm preaching on the Old Testament. Keep in mind that the task is to preach both law and gospel. So we're going to have to find Jesus in this text and make application to the gospel. So our Old Testament lesson is from the prophet Amos. And I'm going to make a judgment here that most of us are not very familiar with the prophet Amos, other than he was a prophet of God. While we live in a very privileged nation, and it might sound like the gospel according to Spider-Man, but there is no privilege that comes without responsibility. We like to think there is. We like to act like there is, but no. Power, special power, special privilege brings with it great responsibility. One of the commenters, uh, commentators that I read in preparation for this sermon pointed out that one of the privileges that we have is to possess the Word of God. And unlike other places in the world or in other times, we have multiple Bibles in our homes available to us whenever we wish. We're free to read them at our leisure, study them, write about them, read and discuss it publicly. No restrictions. This is an amazing privilege which we needlessly neglect. What responsibility do you suppose comes with such a privilege? I submit that we will not be permitted to keep it if we're, not going, if we're going to continue to neglect it. Perhaps we might know who the prophet Amos was then and, and what he said. It, it doesn't surprise you that a nation of God's people so blessed with the word of God should be so ignorant of it. In some ways it surprises me. So I should ground this sermon in the context of today. And by today, I mean the 23rd Sunday after Pentecost. There are only two Sundays left in the church year, and then Advent begins. So these last few readings of the church year have to do with um, the end of the world as we know it. The advent of the kingdom of God. Our readings, our lesson, and our gospel focuses on the eschaton, the end times, fancy word. And Amos' prophecy seems to have been delivered on a visit to Bethel in the northern kingdom. That was before the fall of Israel. Amos lived in Judah in the southern kingdom. He was sent north with a message to Israel. He was a contemporary with the prophet Hosea. Uh, meaning they knew each other and that they probably had some interactions also with Elijah and Elisha and maybe even Jonah when he was young. His work was during the time of Uzziah, who was king of Judah, and Jeroboam, who was king of Israel. The northern tribes had apostatized, meaning that they'd abandoned their faith for the most part. Not all abandoned their faith, but many. 
and they uh, adopted calf worship and Baal worship. It's not so different today, although the people may not be bowing down before cows and before fertility symbols, but they are still worshiping an invented God of their own imagination. So the Lord God sent Elijah and Elisha to the people with no avail. So Amos and Hosea now come on the scene about the time that Elijah and Elisha are coming off. If you were a fan of the Game of Thrones with all of its political intrigue, I mean, even with the political intrigue of our nation today, has nothing on the reality of life lived in Judah and Israel in those days. A commander by the name of Yehu had thrown Jezebel out the window to be eaten by dogs. And a counter-revolution was taking place in Judah, where Alethea, the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel, had married Jeroboam, king of Judah. And when her son Ahaziah was slain in Yehu's uprising, Alethea took advantage, murdered the rest of her family, seized power for herself, and ruled Judah for six years until the priests brought out of hiding her little grandson, Joash, whom they had rescued. So the pagan idolatrous Alethea was put to death, and Joash was placed on the throne. And the two nations kind of got along with each other for about 50 years, which, you know, during which time they had become prosperous, but continued to become decadent. When Amos entered into Bethel to proclaim that Israel would be destroyed, no one believed him. Israel was in the prime of its power. Why should they? There was prosperity, but they were brazen in their idolatry, reeking with moral decay. The land was filled with swearing and stealing, injustice and oppression, robbery, adultery, murder. It was not unlike the world today. Amos opens his prophecy by speaking of the lofty justice and the inflexible righteousness of God. He directed his criticisms first to the nations around Israel. He was really drawing a crowd because of it. He spoke against Syria for their cruelty, against Philistia for making slaves, against Phoenicia for breaking treaties. He spoke judgment against Edom for its revengeful spirit against Ammon for its violent crimes. And then he spoke against Moab because of its injustice. And he spoke against Judah for despising the law. Naturally, the people welcomed this message, as people so often welcome complaints directed at others. They wanted to hear more, of course, until he laid the most damning judgment at the feet of Israel. He spoke against them for their, immoral, their immorality and their blasphemy. Funny thing is, when you speak the truth, there are those who simply don't want to hear it. They get angry when you say it. And Israel had hardened in its idolatry and its wickedness was now speeding to ruin like a crazy driver with his foot on the gas pedal. And Jesus had sent Amos to stay the nation from its mad dash toward death. He laments over the fall of Israel and appeals to them to, to return to their true God and denounce their evil ways. Some were willing to turn away from that God to make sacrifices to the true God instead of to a calf. But Amos had to make clear to him this wasn't about sacrifice or empty religious ceremonies. God was calling them to a reformation in the manner of their whole life. Turn, O sinner, he says. Turn, why will you die? He's trying to, you know, Amos, take the wheel. <laughs> These words of alarm were to wake up the sleeping saints that they may hear the warning and repent while there was yet time. Amos reminds me strongly of a, of a hymn that we sing for, for Advent. You know, my Lord, what a morning when the stars begin to fall. You will hear the trumpet sound to wake the nations underground. Looking to my God's right hand when the stars begin to fall. 
You will hear the sinner cry to wake the nations underground, looking to my God's right hand as the stars begin to fall. You will hear the Christian shout to wake the nations underground, looking to my God's right hand as the stars begin to fall. And in our gospel lesson, Jesus says that while they were still on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived and the virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet and the door was shut. Amos tells a story. He says he describes this like a man who runs from a lion only to run headlong into a bear and then to manage to escape the bear and arrive safe at home, put his hand on the doorpost. Amos tells the people that so often God's judgments have passed by them, have missed them, have been withheld from falling down upon them in calamity. But in this story, it ends not with a heavy sigh of relief but with a sudden and unlooked for strike of a serpent. To avoid every calamity, only to be taken unprepared, bitten by a snake, and die. Up to now, you have escaped the angel of death, for it has passed you by countless times, Amos tells him. But this time, the Lord will not pass by you. This time, the Lord will pass through you. And woe to those who desire the day of the Lord's judgment, that wish for times of war and confusion, those who long for change, hoping to profit from the ruins of a broken nation. Amos warns that this ruin will be so great a desolation that no one could ever profit by it. And that the day of the Lord will be dark and dismal and gloomy to all who are impenitent sinners. And when God makes a day dark, the whole world cannot make it light again. And those who will not be reformed by the judgments of God will be pursued by them. And if they escape one, they will run into another. And if they escape the other, they will be taken unaware, even in their own homes where they imagine themselves in safety. It's folly. The warning here is reflected in our gospel lesson, having to do with the empty lamps, empty of faith, just going through the motions, not really taking the gift seriously. For in God's mind, that he should hate and despise our empty feasts as though what we were to offer him were tokens of our wealth, only to use them again on ourselves, he will not accept them. And the music of our hymnody to him is like screeching violins or fingernails on a chalkboard. It's a way of saying faith without works is dead and death is a stench in God's nostrils. In a sense, Amos is saying that evil times will not bear with playing fair for evil men will not play fair and so the wise and good men thought it was in vain even to speak to the evil. In other words, when times are wicked, the prudent will be silent. But Amos wasn't silent. He was imprudent. He spoke of truth to save the wise, to divert them from the land of ruin. And it behooves us also to proclaim God's promises and beseech him to create in us a clean heart to renew a right spirit within us. The Lord is ever ready to be gracious to the soul that seeks him. And so we are to take courage during such times. For the Lord is with us. Therefore, hate evil, love which is good, maintain justice in the courts. This is what Amos says. And in this way, perhaps, Amos says, the Lord Almighty will have mercy on the remnant of Joseph. Amen. The peace which passes understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus.